This is the Three Even Sabbath School panel. My name is John Dinsey, and it's a pleasure for me to be with you. We have a Sabbath School panel. Part of the Three Avian family is here, and we are on lesson number nine. It's actually a question. Contrary passages? Our panel begins with Sister Shelley Quinn to my left. Oh, I am so excited. I get to do today with me in paradise. Amen. Praise the Lord. We have Pastor Terry Shelton. What day do you have, and what's the title? I'll be presenting Tuesday's lesson, which is entitled, To Depart and Be with Christ. Mm. Amen. And Pastor Ryan Day, welcome. Amen. I have Wednesday's lesson, and we're going to be talking about preaching to the spirits in prison. Mm, so Excellent. Glad got that one. <laughs> <laughs> and Pastor James Rafferty, and what day do you have? What's the title? I have Thursday's lesson, and I have the contrary passage in Revelation 6, Souls Under the Altar. Oh, praise the Lord. Well, as you can see, friends, it's going to be a very interesting Sabbath School panel discussion and uh, actually study. And before we go to that study, we'd like to ask Sister Shelley Quinn if you'll lead us in prayer. Absolutely. Oh, our glorious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before you now to confess our weakness and our great need of you. We ask that you'd fill us with the Holy Spirit, Lord. Give us clarity because these passages are misunderstood and misinterpreted and they misdirect people. So, Lord, send your Holy Spirit now to be the teacher and help us to speak your word clearly. We thank you for you, the answer to the prayer of faith. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Well, as we go into Saturday's portion of the lesson, uh, I'd like to go and read the memory text for you. It's John chapter 5 and verse 39. It says, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. The lesson brings out a text in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, where Peter warns us, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. And, of course, Paul exhorts us to preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. But it also says, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. So in this week, we, in this week's study, we will study the passages that are somewhat intriguing that people use to justify what has been for hundreds of years now, uh, what they call the natural immortality of the soul. Is the soul immortal? What does the Bible say about that? These reflections, uh, the lesson says, should strengthen our own convictions and help us to answer quickly those who question this crucial teaching. So we are going to dive into Sunday's portion, which is the rich man and Lazarus. This uh, passage is taken from Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. And the first question that we have to ask ourselves, is this a literal description of afterlife? Or is this a parable? Some scholars say it's a parable. Some scholars say it's a literal description of what happens when you die. But uh, let's consider first what the Bible does teach, because if this is teaching about what happens after life, we have to take a look at the background of the Bible. And there are so many passages. We have been going already through eight lessons where we see that the Bible teaches that after you die, you are resting in the grave, awaiting either the first resurrection, that is the resurrection of the righteous, or the second resurrection, which is the resurrection of damnation, or the resurrection, resurrection of the wicked. This is what the Bible teaches, and I hope you have been following along thus far. And this is going to be brought out a little bit as we continue uh, going through these different passages that it seem to be contrary. But first, I would like to go to Matthew 25, verse 31 and 32. It says, when the Son of Man comes in His glory, this is Jesus speaking, and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And He will set the sheep on the right hand, but the goats on the left. So this is when that separation takes place, when Jesus Christ comes in glory. 
Revelation 22, 12 says, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. So we see that Revelation 22, 12 establishes, declares very plainly that the reward that the righteous receive and the wicked receive begin when Jesus Christ returns. And so let's take a look uh, at a few passages that talk about the state of the dead, those that die. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5 and 6, the Bible says, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know not anything, not or know nothing, it says, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have a, a share in anything done under the sun. This, of course, runs into direct contradiction to what people popularly believe. They go to uh, people that read cards or they go somewhere where they're calling supposedly the dead and the dead seem to know things. Uh, I even remember watching a program on a popular news channel where this person was interviewing a person that supposedly talks to the dead and was even, according to the program being shown, able to describe what the dead relatives were wearing and the person whose relative was called in question said, yes, she normally wears a blue sweater. And so the devil knows how to deceive. The Bible says the dead know not anything. They know nothing. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10 says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. There is none of that. Psalms chapter 6, verse 5 says, for in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave, who will give you thanks? Psalm 115, verse 17 says, The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. So the idea that when you die, you go to heaven, if you are righteous and you're praising the Lord, enjoying all the benefits and joys of heaven, is not a biblical doctrine. It's when Jesus Christ comes that the reward is given. So uh, in, it's interesting that this parable says that the rich man goes to Hades. Well, when we look at the word Hades in the Bible, in the New Testament that is, you will find that of the 11 occurrences, 10 of them talk about Hades as being the grave or the, the abode of the dead. And so uh, it doesn't say anything about that the Hades is a place of torment and fire except in this one passage in Luke chapter 16. So the weight of the evidence is that Hades, when the Bible mentions Hades, is a place where the uh, dead are waiting for the first resurrection or the second resurrection. If you take the word Hades and you say, this is the place or the abode of the wicked that they are suffering in the agonies of hell in flames, then you have a serious problem with Jesus. Because this is what it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 25, 26, and 27. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, it says in the um, in the new King, I mean the King James Version, but in the New King James, New King James Version, it actually uses the word Hades. You will not leave my soul in Hades, neither will thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. This is talking about Jesus. So if you say that Hades is the place where the wicked are suffering, then you're saying that Jesus was in hell where there's fire and brimstone. So we have limited time. Uh, in Luke chapter 16, uh, it is talking about the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And this is a parable after a list of other parables that were told, beginning with Luke chapter 15. And who is the audience? Luke chapter 15, verse 1, 2, and 3 says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eateth with them. 
and he spake this parable unto them, saying. So Luke chapter 15 begins with parables, and it spills over into Luke chapter 16. Remember, there were no chapter divisions in the Bible. This, these were added on later. Let's move quickly to the parable. I practically only have time to read it. There was, certainly, there was a certain rich man who, clo who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate. And actually, the name Lazarus in Hebrew means a man destitute of help, a needy poor man. This is what Lazarus means. And this is the name Jesus gives this person, Lazarus. And it says, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Verse 22, so it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus, was, and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. You can see that the elements of this parable uh, are, are actually a parable, not a literal thing. Can you really cool somebody with a drop of water on the tongue? And it says, but Abraham said, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and like." Wise Lazarus, Lazarus, evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, uh, five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. So this is really the message of the parable that even if one uh, rises from the dead, the people that Jesus was talking to would not be persuaded. Uh, soon after this, Jesus uh, rose Lazarus from the graves. And later, Jesus himself rose from the dead and still they did not believe. So this parable uh, really cannot be used. Actually, parables, uh, most scholars will agree, are, are not to be used to form doctrines, to prove doctrines. And so the elements of this parable, Jesus was just trying to bring out a, a, the understanding that if you are rich, you not necessarily will go to heaven. This was a popular belief in those mm -hmm. days. And so this is a parable and we should not uh, look at that, but consider the fact that even though if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rise from the dead. Amen. Thank you for that. Uh, I am Shelley Quinn, and my lesson is Mondays, Today with Me in Paradise. If I had to retitle this lesson, I would call it The Significance of a Comma. In the original Bible text, both in the Hebrew and Aramaic of the Old Testament and the Greek of the New Testament, it was not written with punctuation. It didn't have chapter divisions. It didn't have verse divisions. So there was absolutely no punctuation. And when Bible translators put it into our modern language, they had the dilemma of deciding where they wanted to put the punctuation. So let's look at this significant text that people use to prove that you're in heaven right away. Here's what happened. On the day of Jesus' crucifixion, there were three crosses on the hill. Two men, guilty before God and guilty before humanity, were crucified and the Lord of glory the one who stepped down out of heaven to take on our flesh and die for us. The Lord of glory was crucified between them. Now, at first, both of these 
thieves, these uh, criminals. criminals, were hurling insults at Jesus Christ along with the crowd. But eventually, one of them saw in Jesus, they saw his compassion, they, there was something about him and the way he handled himself that they believed he was the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And this criminal humbled himself mm -hmm. and confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, turning to the Lord for forgiveness. He says in Luke 23, verse 42, Lord, and he's, re he's referring to him as Messiah, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He recognized Christ's divine authority. But you know something? He also, in, in the moment of Christ's shame, it, it, he saw him not coming down from the cross to establish a kingdom immediately, a temporal kingdom, but this repentant criminal realized Jesus was the Messiah. Mm -hmm. The spirit of grace helped him see beyond Christ humiliation and shame. And Jesus never ignores a penitent cry. Any time we confess our sin and call on him, he responds. He came not to condemn us, but to condemn sin. So when this man accepted him as Lord, it proves that to us as Jesus responds to him, mm -hmm. that salvation is by grace through faith, not of works, lest any should boast. Mm -hmm. And you know, to me, the everlasting gospel, the everlasting covenant mm -hmm. is salvation by grace through faith, righteousness by faith. And it's two stages. You've got justification by faith, which we, Jesus paid the penalty, but there's also sanctification by faith. This man didn't have time to go through the sanctification process, but Jesus still saved him. So now the translation or the punctuation, I should say, of what Jesus said on the cross has many believing that Jesus promised him that very day, okay, you're going to be with me today in paradise. Let's look at it. It's Luke 23, 43. The way it is written in your Bible and mine, it, it says, assuredly I say to you, comma, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, remember, there was no punctuation in the beginning of these. So this is a translator's idea. But what we want to do is look at what a significant difference, how totally different it translates in our mind if we move that comma. Instead of Jesus saying, I tell you, comma, today you'll be with me in paradise. Move that comma. I tell you today, comma, you will be with me in paradise. So what we want to do is look and see how, if we insert the punctuation, how we do it accurately. Here's something that's interesting. Today is an adverb and it goes with the verb. So Luke uses two verbs. I say to you, to tell, that's a verb. And the second verb is to be, that you will be with me. What Luke typically does in 14 of the 20 occurrences, when he uses this word today, he attaches it to the verb before. Hmm. So if he is saying, go today, then there would be a comma afterward. It would be with the go. So the, the most accurate translation would be, I say to you today, the verb, the adverb today goes with to say. Mm. You will be with me in paradise. Now let's look and see if Jesus 
was prom if I'm telling you accurately, because this is a big one. A lot of people mm -hmm. use this. Mm -hmm. So here's the assumption that if you believe the commas in the right place, I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. If you believe that on that day, Jesus was saying, okay, you're going to come be with me in paradise. That totally contradicts his words to Mary Magdalene. Let's mm -hmm. look at that. On John, it's on John chapter 20. 20 and verse 17. Mary's standing outside the tomb. She's weeping because she thinks somebody has stolen the Lord. All she sees are the linen cloths in his tomb. His body is gone and she's weeping. And she sees the silhouette of a man mm -hmm. and she doesn't recognize, she thinks it's the gardener and she doesn't recognize it's Jesus. And she's weeping and he's saying, what's wrong? And she said, oh, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and then I will take him away. Mm -hmm. And at that point, all Jesus says to her is Mary, and she recognizes her voice. Mm -hmm. Isn't it amazing how you can recognize the voice of your loved one? Mm -hmm. And she recognizes this and she grabs hold of him. And in John 20, verse 17, Jesus says to her, pay close attention. Do not cling to me. This is Sunday morning, mm -hmm. the morning of his resurrection. He was crucified on Friday. He spent Sabbath in the grave. This is Sunday morning. and. Jesus says to Mary, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Do you get that? Mm -hmm. How could the thief have been that day with Christ in heaven, in paradise, if Jesus wasn't in heaven on Friday? Mm -hmm. So, He's telling her, don't cling to me. I've not yet ascended to my father. This is Sunday morning. And it's impossible then that Jesus would have said to the thief, okay, mm -hmm. I tell you, come on, today you're going to be with me in paradise. No, because he didn't go to paradise. Mm -hmm. So we have to look at Luke's, how he used the word today mm -hmm. as an adverb. It always, he always used it to describe the verb in front of today. Mm. So Jesus was saying, I tell you today, I'm making you this promise on this day, you will be with me in paradise. Mm -hmm. He doesn't tell him when, but we know <clears throat> what Jesus said in John 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I will come again and receive you to myself. When he comes with that last sound of a trumpet, mm. that where I am, you may be also. Amen. Thank mm. you very much. Wow. This is a, a program that you're going to want to write down what you hear because it deserves further study. Mm -hmm. And I think we have heard a clear declaration of what the Bible says. We'll be back in just a moment. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Abian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3 abiansabbathschoolpanelcom a clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. We continue with the lesson study, Contrary Passages. We now move to Pastor Terry Shelton. Thank you, John. Uh, my lesson is, uh, by the way, my name is Terry Shelton. And my lesson is Tuesdays to depart and be with Christ. Mm -hmm. How many of you read that passage before? Mm -hmm. Oh, I, 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 depart and be, for, be with Christ, right? It, the lesson points us right to Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 24. And I will read that passage. It says, For to me to live is Christ, 
and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. So just a surface reading of this passage would seem to say that, that Paul was of the opinion that, that when he died, that he would depart and go and be with Jesus. But is that what Paul was actually saying? You see, Paul understood that the final goal of the follower of Jesus is to receive eternal life. And of course, who doesn't want eternal life, right? The right. way Jesus promised it. I know I do, and I know each of my panelists do as well. But Paul was looking at this as a choice, a choice between two things. One, to go to sleep and wait for the second coming. And I think in previous lessons, and we will still to come, we will prove that Paul did believe in that sleep and waiting for the second coming. Or two, to continue on and to minister to as many people as he could. Now, as I thought about this choice, I thought, what if someone were to come to me one day, perhaps on a day when I was really hungry, and they said, uh, we have here for you to choose from two fruits, uh, a banana or a mango, but you can only choose one. Well, I'm going to say to myself, well, how am I going to choose? I like both of those. I can only choose one of them. This is similar to what Paul was expressing here. He, he, he understood that if he went to sleep, that, um, that he would sleep until the resurrection call from the Lord Jesus. But he also understood that if he would continue on, he could continue to minister to people. Mm -hmm. So the lesson says, when did Paul expect to be with Christ? And it points us to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. I know we've covered this numerous times throughout this quarterly, but I'm going to read it again because it is so applicable to this study. He says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. There's that word sleep. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with, those, bring, bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. There it is again. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Third time. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And I love how he ends this, this passage here. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. Of course, as a follower of Jesus, Paul had a desire to actually be with Jesus, not just living in Christ here and now, but to actually be with him in the future. Have you ever pictured what it's going to be like to be with Jesus one day in that glorious home? How wonderful that's going to be. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that is the case with you as well, that you wonder and you picture being with Jesus. But by reading his words from the passage that we just read, we can see that, that Paul had a proper understanding of what it meant to die mm -hmm. and to go into an unconscious state, a sleep until the coming of the Lord. But you know, friends, unfortunately, there is a very popular teaching today, even in the Christian circle, that when God's people die, that their soul somehow rises from the body and, 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 and goes to be with Jesus and the body goes into the ground. Friends, this is not what the Bible teaches. Um, I, there, I can't say it enough. There's plenty of biblical evidence to prove that this is just not the case. I like the words of Paul when he wrote to the Roman church in Romans chapter 14 and verse 8, when he said, For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. So was Paul implying after death that his soul would depart and, 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 and live consciously with Christ? Certainly not. Um, 
there's a quote from the lesson that, that I, I really liked. It said, Paul verbalizes his desire to leave this present troubled existence and to be with Christ without reference to any lapse of time that may occur between the two events. This verse does not teach that Paul expected to go to heaven at death. He was very clear that he would not receive his reward until the second coming. Mm -hmm. And you can see the reference for 2 right. Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. I, you know, Jesus, we covered this one already too. Jesus said in Revelation chapter 22 and, and verse 12, I am, behold, I am coming quickly yes. and my reward is where? Already given? Already doled out to people? No, no, no. My reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Mm. See, no one has received their mm -hmm. reward yet. That's right. With the exception of those couple of, mm. couple of fine people who were translated, right? Um, no one has received their reward. You know, when I think about this sleep, it's not hard to visualize that sleep that the Bible refers to. Um, how many of us have gone to bed at night, you worked hard mm -hmm. and your body is just exhausted and you lay down and you close your eyes and the next thing you open your eyes again and six or seven or eight hours have passed and you have no knowledge of the passage of time. This is similar to what it's going to be like without the dreaming, of course. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's a couple of other passages. First Corinthians 15, we've covered that before. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. I'm going to pass over that one for now. But the Bible refers to death as some, like 54 times refers to it as sleep. Mm -hmm. And Paul understood very well that if God were to choose to lay him to rest, that he would close his eyes one moment and the very next moment from his point of view, his eyes would be open and he would see the second coming of Jesus. You know, particularly in hard times, maybe some of us have wished that we could go to sleep, you know, and not wake up until that, until that great and wonderful day when Jesus comes. Right now at this time, um, while we're doing this recording, I know someone, someone very close to me who is close to that edge. And this person has said to her loved ones, you know, I know that a difficult time is coming upon planet Earth and I just soon be laid to rest. And, you know, if, unless God intervenes, that is probably going to be the case. You can understand someone who might say that I don't want to go through this. I don't want to deal with this, this pain in my body or this suffering or whatever it is that we're going through. Please, God, let me lay to rest and open my eyes to see that great and wonderful day, mm. you know, and. When someone goes to sleep in Jesus, their cares of this life are over mm. and they are just waiting for that time. And it, it just is. And they are true. We can truly say for me to live is Christ Amen. and to die is gain. Mm. Friends, if you're hearing this for the first time, maybe you've just tuned in and you're hearing these teachings and you say, oh, this is all new to me. Write in or call to, into 3ABN and ask for more study materials. They have plenty on staff on the subject of what happens when we die and learn what the Bible clearly teaches mm. about what we call the state of the dead. Yeah, mm. yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Pastor Terry. I am Ryan Day. I have Wednesday's lesson and it's entitled Preaching to the Spirits in Prison. Mm. And folks, I'm telling you, this is one of those that so many people use to try to uh, communicate the fact that even Jesus himself, they try to say Jesus himself, while he was dead in the grave, he went down into mm. hell and he preached to dead souls from the antediluvian time back in Noah's day. He went down and declared and preached to those dead, wicked souls in hell. Uh, and then, of course, you know, he left and came back and, you know, and, and overcame that death. But nonetheless, the preaching to the spirits in prison, we got to take a close look at this and, and make sure that we allow the Word of God to interpret itself. And so what I would like to do, I'm going to present a couple, a couple of viable options here that I believe are possible. I mean, this is a tough passage. I'm going to just say this right up front. This is one of those that I have not met yet a minister that just 
has really nailed this down 100% because it, there's, some, there's some details here that we are still studying even to this day. But I'm going to present a couple of viable options that I believe, uh, regardless of which view you believe or you resonate with the, the most, the one overall arching point that we want to make here is that when we study the Scripture in context and with the rest of Scripture, we understand very clearly that Jesus did not go down into hell and preach to dead souls because that would completely contradict all of the rest of the Bible that we're studying. Mm -hmm. And that's the main, major overarching point that we want to make here. Um, I want to read what the, what, the, what the lesson brings out here. It says here, we should notice that in 1 Peter chapter 3, the spirits in prison of verse 19 are identified in verse 20 as disobedient antediluvians in the days of Noah. The term spirit, which is in the Greek, it's the Greek word pneuma, is used uh, in this text and elsewhere in the New Testament. And they quote 1 Corinthians 16, 18, Galatians chapter 6, verse 18, in reference to the living people who can hear uh, and accept the invitation of salvation. The expression in prison obviously refers not to a literal prison, but to the prison of sin in which the uh, unregenerate human nature is found. And of course, they quote uh, here or reference Romans 6, 1 through 23, Romans 7, 7 through 25. And it goes on to say, Christ preaching to the impenitent antediluvians was accomplished through Noah, who was divinely instructed by God, according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, and became a preacher of righteousness to his contemporaries, according to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Peter's verses were written in the context of what it means to be faithful. They are not a commentary on the state of the dead. And that is absolutely true. This is not, these, these texts are not a commentary on the state of the dead. That's not what Peter is trying to accomplish here. Let's go back and read this passage in great detail. And I'm just kind of go through, and we're going to break this down in a greater fashion here with the time left that we have. 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to start with verse 18, and we're going to make our way on through to verse 22. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, and in parentheses here, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who, and I love this last part, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. So let's break this down with a little bit of time. Pray for that clock because I have a little bit of time here. But let's just kind of look at this and, and try to decipher according to the rest of support of scripture what this is saying in a deeper fashion here. So 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, where it says, For Christ also, also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, us, that he might bring us to God. Here's the key here, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. That's an important point here. You see, the Bible confirms that Jesus took the form of mortal human flesh so that he might destroy the works of sinful flesh according to his death. And you can find that in Hebrews 2, 14 and 16, as well as Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. And of course, being made alive in the flesh, okay? He was made alive, excuse me, being made alive by the spirit. Uh, this part of the text is identifying the fact that Christ was raised from the dead by God through the Holy Spirit. Jesus' mortal flesh died and was buried. And of course, however, he was given a heavenly glorified body at his resurrection and thus being made alive by the Spirit. So this is now talking within the context of Christ's resurrected power, his, the resurrected Christ with this new heavenly glorified body. But it goes on to say, by whom, and this is verse 19, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Now this by whom can also be understood as in which state. So if you were to read that, in which state he also went and preached to the spirits in prison. This is a continuance of the previous uh, part of the verses where it talks about him being made alive in the spirit. That is in reference to after his resurrection. So he goes and preaches to the spirits in prison after being made alive and his resurrection by the Spirit. And of course, the text goes and says that he went. Where did he go? Where, in what direction? Well, the text doesn't necessarily bring that specific point out, although this is the same word in the original Greek. It's the word uh, poriume, poriumeo. I guess that's poriumei. There it is. It's a hard word to say in the Greek. But it's the same word used in Acts chapter 1, verse 10 that confirms Christ going up. 
and actually, if you tie this to the very last verse within the context of this passage, and you read 1 Peter 3, 21 and 22, the last part of 21 into 22 there, it says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. So when Christ was made alive by the Spirit, as we just learned, where did He end up going? He ended up going back to heaven, right, to his father. But there's a proclamation, there's a declaration made because it says he preaches to the spirits in prison. This word for spirit simply means to proclaim, to declare, to proclaim like the three angels' messages or to declare the gospel or to declare, in this case, Christ is declaring dominion over these spirits in prison. And so now the question becomes, who are these spirits? Well, if you allow the Bible to interpret itself, if you do a word search, I have a Strong's Concordance, and I actually just did this before I presented this. If you type in the word spirits that you find here in your Strong's Concordance, it comes up some 45, 46 times in all the Bible. In every single time, it's always in connection with unclean or evil spirits. Never once is it in connection with human spirits, because the Bible never refers to human spirits in the plural. It may refer to you as, 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 as my spirit or your spirit, but never spirits in the plural, lowercase s. It's always in connection with unclean spirits. For instance, Luke chapter 10, verse 18 through 20. It says, And he said unto them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Verse 20, Nevertheless, do not rejoice to this, that the spirits are subject to you, referring to unclean spirits. Luke chapter 11, verse 24 to 26. Again, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none. But if you get down to verse 26, it says, then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, referring to unclean spirits there. Mark chapter 1, verse 27. Then they were all amazed, and so they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean, there it is, same word, spirits, and they obey him. So when it's used in the plural, and by the way, this is just three examples, many, many, many examples uh, in the plural as it given all throughout the Old and New Testament referencing unclean spirits. So Christ preached to, according to Scripture, he made a declaration over these unclean spirits, of oh, the dominion over them. In fact, it says they were spirits in prison. What are they imprisoned? This earth is their prison. They were cast out of heaven. In fact, the Bible makes it very clear in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 24, verse 19 and 22, or 19 through 22. These are some references because I'm running out of time. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3, when Satan is bound by change of circumstances to this earth, this pit, this bottomless pit. And of course, notice this, Jude 6. Powerful text. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Again, the, the, the spirits, the, unfall, or the fallen angels are also imprisoned. And 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 also says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. And so again, they are imprisoned. And when Christ resurrected on that day, he declared the dominion over them. How do we know this? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22. What does it say? Same passage. This is our key passage. Who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. So Jesus ascended into heaven soon after his resurrection. It was here that angels and powers were made subject to him. And there is no doubt that this is a reference to, of course, as we said, fallen angels. My friends, there's a lot that we can be said about this. And this is a passage that we all continue to study. No matter what your belief is on this in regards to whether you believe these spirits are human, whether you believe they're, they're fallen angels, the major overarching point is to prove in this overall study lesson that we're doing on death, dying, and the future hope is that Jesus... Jesus did not, you know, Jesus was asleep in the grave. We proved that he didn't ascend to his father. He wasn't resurrected till Sunday morning. He did not descend down into hell and preach to dead souls in the fiery pits of hell. Jesus remained in the tomb and slept in the grave just as we do until the resurrection day, of course, when he resurrects us. And so I just want to stop there. But the, the point is, is that we need to make sure that we allow the Bible to interpret itself in this situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Brian, I am so glad you had that text. I've got <laughs> it's a tough one, man. Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. And these are challenging texts also. If you'd like to open your Bibles, my name is uh, James Rafferty, and I'm dealing with uh, Thursday's lesson, which is entitled, The Souls Under the Altar. We're in Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Let's just read those verses to begin with. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, verse 10, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood upon them that dwell on the earth? And verse 11, white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Now, these, these texts are, again, added to the ones we've looked at. Contrary texts, question mark. They are seeming to be contrary to what we've understood the rest of the Bible will be teaching on this subject of the state of the dead. Because right here, you have souls under the altar crying out. These souls are slain. They're dead. And so they're crying out. How can we be saying that death is asleep when you know nothing, when you've got souls under the altar who have been slain and they're crying out? And it's very significant for us, or very important for us when we study the Bible and especially the book of Revelation to get our information, to, to get our understanding from the rest of Scripture. And that's what we've been doing mm -hmm. all through this panel. We've been looking at the, the variety of Scriptures that we've been looking at, contrary Scriptures, and we've been going to other portions of the Bible to get uh, correction and direction and understanding. So we're going to do the same here. What's really interesting is that these verses, uh, unlike the ones in Luke with the thief on the cross or the ones we just talked about in 1 Peter, uh, the ones in Philippians, uh, unlike the one even with Lazarus that is really close because it is a parable and parables are very close to what we're looking at here, this is symbolic language. The book of Revelation is filled with symbolic language. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the book of Revelation, you have to realize that the book of Revelation is kind of a summation of the rest of the Bible. I mean, the whole Bible kind of comes together in the book of Revelation. It's distilled down and all of these symbols have huge meaning. And what we have to do as scholars, we go back to the, the rest of the Bible and we connect key words to different stories or sections of scripture to make a connection that then brings us to a conclusion. So some of the key words that we find in here that we're going to parallel to another section in scripture, and this is the key section that we always turn to as Seventh-day Adventists. It wasn't actually in the quarterly in, this, in the lesson, but we're going, to, we're going to look at it anyway, is Genesis chapter 4. Mm -hmm. Genesis chapter 4 is the story of Cain and Abel. Right. And this story is so filled with the symbolism that we find here in Revelation chapter 6. Uh, with Cain and Abel, you had altars. They were worshiping God. They were bringing sacrifices to altars. Cain was bringing the sacrifice of the fruit of his hand. Abel was bringing the sacrifice of the lamb. In the story of Cain and Abel, you have this cry with a loud voice that comes up from the ground as uh, Cain, uh, Abel's blood is spilled. You have the blood. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 3, you have the cry, Genesis 4, verse 10. You have the altars, Genesis 4, verse 4. You have the slain. Uh, Abel is slain by his brother. That's Genesis 4, verse 8. You have the word of God implied here in Genesis 4, verse 7. God is speaking to Cain. God is speaking to Abel. And God is speaking specifically to uh, Cain after and before he slays his brother and trying to reason with him. And of course, we know that Abel does the same thing. The word uh, that is implied there with Abel, but it's definitely revealed with God. And then you have the testimony which he held. This is also in Revelation chapter 6. All these phrases in Revelation chapter 6, uh, Abel had this testimony. And his testimony was not only in, you know, what he may have said to his brother, but it was in his actions. And this is none other than that same old story of righteousness by faith, mm -hmm. right? right? And righteousness by faith is the theme of the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation is specifically taking us, you know, God could have said, oh, I'm going to make this easy for you. I'm not going to talk about slain under the altar and all the symbolism. I'm going to make it easy for you. I'm just going to tell you that during the dark ages, a lot of people were slain and, you know, I want to avenge their blood. But he didn't do that. He used the symbolism here because he wanted to take us back to Cain and Abel and, and remind us that this conflict between those who trust in the Lamb for salvation and those who trust in their works for salvation not only began in the book of Genesis, 
but it took us all the way through the Dark Ages, and we're going to talk a little bit more in our next study. Uh, I've got a, uh, the section uh, on purgatory. We're going to talk a little bit more when we get into this next study, and it takes us all the way through to Revelation chapter 13, where we have a bunch of people who are receiving the mark of the beast and who are worshiping according to man's dictates and others who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's Cain and Abel all over again. That's what we've seen in the garden. That's what we've seen right outside the garden, I should say, in Genesis. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're seeing all the way through the Bible. And that's what we're seeing here in Revelation chapter 6. Now, it's really important for us to just identify a couple things here when we look at the quarterly, because the quarterly misses a point that I think is really significant that Shelley brought up in her presentation. And that is when you get into Revelation chapter 8. Let's just look there. Revelation chapter 8 and verse 3. And I saw another angel, or another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which is before the throne. I wish we had time to get into all that's here, and we're going into a completely different um, session here, section here. But the, the quarterly brings out that some people who misunderstand the souls under the altar here think that this altar is the altar of incense in Revelation 6. And then he directs us to Revelation chapter 8 and these verses. But we need to recognize that because the chapter divisions are inspired of God and were done later, that Revelation chapter 8 verse 1 is the seventh seal. It belongs to the seven seals. It doesn't belong to the seven trumpets. The trumpets do not come under the seventh seal. The seventh seal sounds, the silence in heaven about the space in half an hour, and that is the end of the cycle of the seven seals. In Revelation chapter 8, verse 2, we move into the cycle of the seven trumpets with this phrase, and I saw. I'm just sharing this primarily for our Sabbath school teachers, but also for those of you who are seeking to understand these verses we're looking at in chapter 6. Why? Because, and I saw seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets, and another angel came, mm -hmm and stood at the altar, having the golden censer, verse 3 of Revelation 8, and unto him was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which should be before the throne of God. Okay, there's two altars here. There's an altar where he gets the incense, and there's the golden altar mm -hmm. which is before the throne of God. Right. This new cycle is beginning the apostolic age. Jesus Christ was sacrificed for us on Calvary, and Calvary was the fulfillment of the altar of sacrifice in the courtyard of the earthly sanctuary. Now we read about this in Hebrews chapter 13, beginning in verse 10. Hebrews chapter 13, beginning in verse 10. I'm just going to read verses 10 through 12. We have an altar where they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his blood suffered without the gate. So the author of Hebrews here is very specifically telling us that the altar in the courtyard was a type of Calvary, the place mm -hmm. where Jesus would die, right. Right? right? And as you take that symbolism into Revelation chapter 8, and it's really important, the book of Hebrews is really one of the keys that unlocks Revelation because it's filled with sanctuary language and the book of Revelation is filled with sanctuary language. Revelation 8 is talking about two altars. The first altar is the altar of sacrifice. That represents the cross. When Revelation 8 begins with the seven trumpets, it begins in Christ's day. And it brings this message to us. When Jesus Christ died, he took his sacrifice, the merits of his sacrifice, Ephesians 5, 2, he took that to heaven. And he offers that, he mingles yes. that with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which happens to be in the holy place. Remember, we're going back to the ascension of Christ. When he ascended in AD 31, he went to the holy place, not the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. He takes that sacrifice uh, identified in Ephesians 5, 2 as a sweet smelling savior. He takes that sacrifice to heaven and he mingles it with the prayers of the saints and it comes up before God and it's acceptable of God. All of our prayers, whatever we pray, is acceptable with, to God because it is covered with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amen. So when we take this back now, what we're seeing here is in the dark ages, there were millions of people who said, you know what? We're not compromising the truth. Mm -hmm. We're not compromising. We're not going to accept legalism. We're not going to accept works. We're not going to accept walking upstairs on our knees and trying to make ourselves right with God. We're standing under the cross and under the cross they stood and under the cross they died. Mm -hmm. They were sacrificed. That's why the symbol here is they're under the altar. That means they died believing in righteousness by faith. 
they died believing that Jesus Christ was the only way they could be saved ever, mm -hmm. that their works were not meritorious, would right. never be meritorious. Oh yes, they believed in sanctification. Oh yes, they believed in holiness. Oh yes, they believed in living for God, but they could never trust in those works to merit in any way, shape, mm -hmm. or form their salvation. And this is the picture we see in Revelation chapter 6. It's not a picture of the state of the dead. As the author makes very clear in the Sabbath school lesson, it is a picture of righteousness by faith. Amen. 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 Beautiful. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, thank you, Pastor James Rafferty, Pastor Ryan Day, Pastor Terry Shelton, and Sister Shelley Quinn. We now give you a moment to give a final thought. I guess my thought would be this. The Bible never contradicts itself. We read, when we study, we have to read in context. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the context of the chapter. It may need to be um, the context of the entire book it's written in, but more than that, the context of the entire Bible. I've heard people say the Bible contradicts itself. Mm -mm. Never. If we ever find anything that we feel is contradictory, we need to be humble enough to say, Lord, teach me more and help me mm -hmm. understand. Amen. Amen. I guess my, my thought is that uh, we have to be very careful when we take a small passage of scripture and build an entire doctrinal mm -hmm. uh, statement on that. We can't mm -hmm. do that. Um, I'm reminded of a, a passage that comes from Isaiah. My brothers can, or sister could probably tell me where, line upon line, precept upon precept, here, there, and little there. When we study a doctrinal subject, we must look at all of scripture. What does the Bible have to say? We can't take one one passage and just roll with it and say, oh, Paul believed that to, do, to, be, uh, to depart from this, uh, this world would be to be with Christ. That's not what the Bible teaches. We must look at it in its proper uh, setting. Amen. Just a conclusion of my day. Jesus was made alive by the Holy Spirit so that he could claim the victory over the sin of the world and thus claim dominion over the earth and the fallen angels of this world. He also had overcome Satan in the darkness of this world. He did not preach to dead spirits, but rather proclaim victory over the evil spirits and made them subject to his majesty. Mm. And I just love the fact that we can understand the Bible, that there are scriptures that seem to be contrary and that God can give us the wisdom through the Holy Spirit to figure that out as long as we keep our focus on Christ as our righteousness. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. I go to Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, and it says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So I ask you, when you consider Lazarus and the rich man, the rich man in hell in torment, how can there be joy if there will be conversation between those in heaven and those in hell? How could a mother enjoy seeing her child in hell suffering the torments? This is just a parable. Hey, next week, it's lesson number 10, the fires of hell. We hope you will join us.